Hi. My name is Leanne Ellis, and this is BB Book Buzz. And we are going to talk today about some of our favorite reads over the last couple of weeks that um, perhaps may inspire you to pick them up. Um, I am a retired librarian. I used to work at the BB, and with me today is Jackie, who is from, um, she's from our administration. She's an assistant director. And also Beth and Bridget, who are reference librarians at the BB. So I, we're gonna begin by having Bridget talk about a book that she'd like to share with you. All right. So I'm gonna talk about um, The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, which is a recent horror release. And uh, I think when you have a title sort of as provocative as The Only Good Indians, you should acknowledge that the author is himself a Native American author. Uh, the the um, book is about four friends who are all, they're Blackfoot Indian. They, they're, they're from Blackfoot and they, uh, so they do something which we come to learn that is, is a transgressive event. They have done something wrong. And this sort of bad action that they've taken is haunting them into their adulthood. So they did this as very young men. They were basically teenagers just post high school and they they have done this bad thing. And I, I'm only be I'm just going to be vague because it is sort of a mystery when you find out in the book. So it is it is sort of a mystery that they have this this like this event that they have done. And this is haunting them. Now it is now we sort of pick up the action, the like we find out that they did something. Then we go far into the future and we kind of pick up the action about 10 years later or we check in with these people and in that at that time the this haunting event which which has shaped their lives but is about to come back in a very strong way which is that someone is something is finding vengeance against them for what they have done it's kind of a slow burn book so you follow the it's it's very character based in the beginning. You're sort of following one character for a very long time. It's, it's interesting. And then, and to my mind, as a person who does read horror, didn't read, I was like, this is kind of horror light. Like this is, this is like spooky, but not necessarily graphic or violent. That changes about halfway through the book and it gets very violent in a, in a, uh, in an intense way, I would say. It's still, it's very well done. I don't think it's, it's not like graphic or over the top, it's it's very well done and it feels appropriate kind of for the kind of story that we're telling. And you continue following the following this vengeance, this quest for vengeance. And I, one of the things that I found most interesting is the there's a moment when you realize who is the uh, point of view of this story which is we you sort of for most of the book feel it's an an omniscient or a third party narrator and it is but it isn't which is something that you discover later and i really enjoyed that uh that moment and when you figure out what what story you've actually been hearing through this through this book uh it actually does offer like the possibility of redemption or hope in the end, even though it is quite a violent book, I would say. And uh, it's, a, it's a vengeance story. It's a, it, and I, it's like hard to explain because it's very modern. It's set in the, it's set in the present day. It's not, in, it's not in the past though. It's dealing with like deep old concepts, but it is set in the modern day. It's a slow born horror, as I said, but it does get graphic, not, in a way that I felt was wrong, but it isn't, if you aren't into horror, you probably wouldn't want to read it. <laughs> so it does get pretty graphic. And I just think it's such an interesting perspective. And I really liked the writing as well. I think it has a beautiful, like, I think uh, Graham Jones has a beautiful like style that is different. And um, this actually comes from a friend of mine who is, who is Native American, who said that 
the way he writes reminds her of her grandfather and the way he talks. And I thought that was very interesting because it wasn't something that I would like, I enjoyed the writing style quite a bit, but I wouldn't necessarily have intimately connected it to the way the to like native language use itself necessarily because it didn't it didn't read that way for me but that that's what she said and I thought that was very interesting so that and and that's a, an endorsement from her as well that she enjoyed all of his books so that's the only good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones um just a really quickly Bridget um the way you described it I definitely understand that it's horror and knowing his you that's what he usually writes anyway but it's like uh do you think that it would appeal to people who like a good thriller a revenge thriller i think yes yeah i think if you, you know yeah i think if you enjoy a good revenge thriller you because i really do think it, it's interesting because that's of course sort of the pov shift is is how you realize that that's what this story is ah. um is yes if you enjoyed that and you if you're okay with the violence because i do think it has a sort of a higher level of violence than i might normally recommend to someone who isn't sort of in that milieu already yeah mm -hmm. i think because horror too is becoming one of these genres where i think it depends on you what bothers you mm -hmm. you know because there's so many different ways it's going and i mean i know that um you and i bridget have both read the return by harrison i think it's captain harrison and, and not to go into that in great detail here, it's well worth it, especially if you want a relationship, sort of a, a you know, a, 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 we chicks get together and, and, you know, talk. It's driven by the dialogue, but there's this other thing going on that absolutely is harrowing, to use one of our, our, our co-worker Karen's favorite words. Seriously, <laughs> harrowing. And it isn't until you get into almost three quarters of the book that you're like, oh my goodness. And then you say, all right, this is horror. But it takes yeah. you to that case and the tone is there from the beginning mm. yeah i thought i i since i did also read that i i made a joke to a friend that the real horror of the return is eventually you grow out of your college friendships like the real <laughs> horror is that you change as a person and you grow <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 agreed agreed so anyway but i mean that's another one it's like there's just been so many different spikes in horror over the last couple of years that go in so many different you know, arcs that it's sometimes hard. You actually have to talk a little bit about each book, I think, with people if you're doing, if you're talking to them about horror. Well, I, movies have really gone, there have been a lot more yeah. of the of movies in that kind of, not like the, the what, what I think of as horror is, you know, like Nightmare on Elm Street, <laughs> right. but like the psychological kind of horror that is I, I tried to become really popular. New one. Did you watch it, Bridget? The one with Elizabeth Banks? No. Couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, and I think it's the, the difference of being scared and screaming and going, oh my God, you know, like that kind of a thing and having it stick to your skin as you close the book or walk away from the movie screen. Those are yeah. different, you know, different feelings. Going yeah. For. Yeah. There was um, a, I did see a review of, uh, of the Only Good Indians that called Stephen Graham Jones the Jordan Peele of literature, which I think yeah. is an apt, um, whereas he's using, and because it, particularly in this where it's like he's using sort of transgressive tropes that are are you are utilized yeah. against native americans to like make this to make the horror like the horror is rooted in sort of the white supremacy which in the same way like get out is so i, yeah, I was like that's a very apt yeah idea right. right and and for for that um subset of, of humanity that mm. that is ongoing and then you know being used to demonstrate the theme so very good, great, thank you, thank you. Uh, so Beth, what have you got for us? So I have um, a psychological fiction in the vein of Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. Um, it's Without a Trace by Mary Torgerson. So in it, Hannah comes home to find Matt, her boyfriend, her perfect boyfriend of four years, gone from their house. Everything of his is gone any of his mugs, his, the photos of them, the, if he had any silverware, everything. She checks her cell phone, nothing. His name is gone, his number, any messages, everything. So hence the title, right? Gone Without a Trace. He is gone. So the, it's like he never existed. The, um, so the book follows her obsessive attempt to try and find him which impacts all the rest of 
the areas of her life. So her, she was just up for a promotion. That looks like she's going to get suspended. She's not bathing. She's really going down a hall. A hole, I'm sorry. <laughs> she could be going down the hall of a boat, a too. Hole. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> um, Also, she's getting these strange texts, and she thinks that someone's been in her house. So was that Matt, or was it somebody else? And she feels like she's being stalked. Again, was that Matt or somebody else? And then... Um, the, the, the other part of this is that it's a first person narration. So is any of that happening or is it all her imagination? Yeah, I thought this would be great for you, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> so is that really happening or is it all in her head? Um, so Torsten weaves all that and she ties in a number of threads like her um, Hannah's best friend, Katie and her boyfriend and she sticks in a few red herrings. There are twists and turns and big surprises at the end. It, you, it's the end, the big surprises mm -hmm. at the end. Um, so like Bridget's, this is a slow burn that gets builds and in intensity. Um, kept me going all the way through because I was going, what in the world is going? Sorry, I don't want to shake this. <laughs> what in the world is going on here? <laughs> um, the characters, they're all believable. The um, Hannah, she goes into, Torgerson goes into her in great depth. Um, I believe her motivations. I believe her interactions. The secondary characters, they're all told through Hannah's point of view. So, but I still felt like they were believable. Um, and the reason why I'm emphasizing the believable is because a lot of people did not find unbelievable. They didn't also find the, they didn't like the ending. I found it all very believable and I, I thought the ending was perfect. Um, it, this reminds me of the Gone Girl controversy where, yeah. where everyone got to the end and they were like, oh, because it's not necessarily satisfying, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah. it's like when you, and I think Leanne, you said this to me, you said, how would you have wanted it to end? And you kind of can't cut everything else would have felt like a cop out. I so think that's, I think, I think you're spot on there, Jackie. I think that is what it is that's going on. Right. And sometimes that realism of not really having an ending means that one, there's no real justice, which is upsetting to a lot of people mm -hmm. that you know, there could go so many other ways, but would they have been, again, as fully um, satisfied? Who knows? So uh, sometimes I think that it's easier to let the writer just take you where they need to go and then we can react to it and rip them up if we have to. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's a fun, I think it's a fun ride. And um, it takes place in Liverpool, which isn't usually a place that's written about. Um, and I think she does a good job with that too. It, it, I've been there, friends there, and she does a good portrayal of it. Um, she shows the little towns and the houses by the canals with enjoyable descriptions, but it's not the main thing. I mean, I think like in Gone Girl, it's the plot. The mm -hmm. characters matter too, but it's the plot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, <laughs> if you need all the things this isn't the book, but if you're okay with the ride, it's a great book. There is violence, and the, and again, I think most of the violence is at the end, like Bridget's, um, and there's bad language. No sex besides kissing and lying on beds. It's, it's a tale of all-consuming obsession, jealousy, and what's beneath that perfect surface. Ah. Okay. Sounds really good. <laughs> and she's written she's written four other books. So. What's, her, what's the name again of the author? Mary Turgeson. Um, T O R J U S S E N. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A mutual friend of ours, Jan, I think, has read her and has told me to read her. So this is another oh, good. Book. Good. Good. Put on my many my ever growing list. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Jackie. I know you you read something that I did too. So I know we're gonna we're gonna get into it. 
Um, <laughs> so I wanted to talk about the House of Trelawney, which was by is by Hannah Rothschild, who you might remember from the Improbability of Love, which came out I think in 2015, maybe. Sounds mm -hmm. about right. Sounds about right. Um, Love that. And this is very different, um, but it's so it's basically about a effectively about a house. <laughs> um, the House of Trelawney is both an actual house uh, in the vein of Downton Abbey, but bigger. Um, and it's this <laughs> own, you know, it's owned by this family, the, the Trelawneys, who are, um, they're earls. It's a fit, so they're in their 20, what, fifth, seventh, 26th generation of earl. Um, and so the, the, the current uh, earl and countess, yes, <laughs> are still alive they're quite they're quite elderly um but they live they live in one part of the house and then the the son who anticipates inheriting the oldest son kiddo and his wife jane and their three children also live in the house um the description of the house i think is just priceless because it, it opens with this description and it's something like there's four miles of hallways there's 400 bathrooms like it's just <laughs> completely ludicrous um and that sounds like um our quarterbacks brady's house yeah <laughs> beyond, like just beyond you know there's 552 fireplaces type thing um but the house now is falling it's derelict it's i mean they they've the last several generations of, of earls have not really done a great job with the money and it's really fallen into disrepair and the the descriptions of the disrepair I think are just priceless they're they're talking about like you know bats living in things and like you like ceiling will just fall on you at certain points and like it's just it's it's great but so basically the the whole story I mean you find out about this this family and their and their lives and their their relationships but it's really the main crux of it is like saving this house trying to keep this house running they have a an oil bill for the heating that is 88,000 pounds overdue. Like they're in the red, like, so whatever, $150,000 to like fill their oils. <laughs> so they like, they don't have any heat. And the, the, the Jane, um, the kind of the, the wife of the son who, who would, it will inherit um, is really trying to hold it together because kiddo, her husband, the future Earl is, he's got this job in London, but it's kind of a fake job that he doesn't really know what he's doing. He's like the chair of a bank. And I should mention this is all set with the backdrop of the 2008 financial crisis. So you, the book starts like in June of that year and goes, I think it's like a year, year and a half. Um, and so the financial crisis is also part of what drives the, the plot. Um, so I thought this book was a lot about the characters and the houses. Of, it, this is one of those stories where the house is very much a character, very, very much like possibly the biggest character. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah in, in many ways. Um, and I really it's enjoyed told it. from the point of view of the house, like like the improbable. No, well, it is told not. from that point of view of the painting. <laughs> I when I read so yes, the in the the probability of love her improbability of love her first book, the there right. are paintings that this painting has its own story and it tells it to you intermittently. Um, no, the house doesn't do that so much as just be, <laughs> fall apart in front of your eyes. Um, so I, I enjoyed it. I had a couple issues with some things, but what did you think, Leanne? Well, I, I, I absolutely was enthralled with it. It's risen to the top of my list of best books of the year for me because it just hits all of my boxes with the character, the place, the pace. I mean, I think what she does is a wonderful job of, you know, this, this is a satire in many ways, a satire yes. of an old, you know, the patriarchal system of mm -hmm. male inheritance and also just the fact that, you know, what roles do you play in society when you come from this long line of, you know, earls and all the other stuff? How do you, how does everything in the, um, in the, how it relates? I mean, this, I think it's set in Cornwall, but it's, it's mm -hmm. the town, the little town and villages around it are all, part of their substance, they support each other, their symbiotic relationship. So it's a lot about how they're viewed by them and what they've done in the past and what they do now. And I mean, it's about so many things, greed, and but it's also driven, as you said, by the house. And some of the characters, 
aren't necessarily ter terribly likable, but you still are sort of like compelled to follow them. And I have to just mention that <laughs> my favorite character, and I loved the sister, I can't remember her name, um, and I uh, love Jane, right. And I love Jane, who is the sister-in-law, the one who's trying to save everything. The kids are great. The baddie aunt who goes around, you know, picking Ugh. up. And that's part of the house. She goes to look, she'll pick up things out of the house that are natural, like, uh, or mice, or birds nesting, or, or fungus. So that she, cause she collects this stuff. That's what she does. And she's got a, <laughs> a whole reputation, uh, academic reputation based on it. It's hilarious. Um, but there's so many things in this, but my favorite character, who is also someone you'll learn to hate as much as you love, is this very poisonous, deluded old matriarch, Clarissa, who oh, is God. <laughs> current countess, who, who acts like nothing has changed, even though sometimes all they're doing is eating takeout. But, but they need to have the servants bring it in, and there's this, it's hilarious, and she's so mean. <laughs> She's terrible. Oh, she's great. <laughs> I, but 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 there's a lot of humor in this book, and some of it mm. comes. From oh her, yeah. But also from some of the repartee between people, and um, you know, it's about friendship. It's about what is really family. I had a problem with a character that comes in. The old there's an old friend whose daughter shows up, and I don't want to say too much because so much of the other plot hinges on who she is and why she shows up. And a lot of what happens through her in this book, I had to sort of take the leap with the author. I don't think she did as good a job. Hmm. Fleshing that out. No, now, is that was one of the problems you had? That was one of the problems I had. I also occasionally felt like there were things that were uneven, but I was, I was willing to forgive it. Like you'd have a whole big stretch yep. of, a, yep. of, a, of something that was kind of drawn out and then she would tie it up in a bow and like, a paragraph not even yeah. tight like but like <laughs> you and you're like wait oh, okay i guess we're moving on from that yes. but it, it yes. was okay i mean it there was and the ending is like that i was a little the disappointed ending i thought was a little abrupt because <laughs> there's some things she addresses and other things she doesn't and you care about all the people and you want to know like for instance um i just want to say that there's something about the uncle and i was like wait a minute they never i know they other he does what he says he's going to do, and it's sort of an important, really. Did, did you say this to me in your email that you think it open, it leaves the door open for a sequel? It could. I, yeah. I mean, it, it, felt, it felt a little unfinished to me, and I, I in, a, in a way that I could accept, but. Yeah. yeah. Do you think I, the sequel could deal with the other points that you thought weren't taken could. care of? Yeah. Could. Oh, yeah, yeah, it could. It definitely could, but I also think that she would really have to come up with a really convoluted reason to go back there to make it have a kind of depth and resonance that this book had. You know, like she, right. does, she spits out another one based on these characters. She's gonna have to come up with a, a, a lot to make it work for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she, it, it's really an interesting look at wealth. Mm, very it's interesting. Look at a system in Great Britain that is obviously outdated but it still runs a lot of the show. So it, it was really an interesting, it made you think there a was, lot. Cause there was that also that component cause the, the sister is a hedge fund right. manager. So yeah. there's this kind of new money, old money um, discussion that's kind of constantly happening and how that, that whole, the 2008, um, the recession and the financial crisis that happened then there's that, the view from the people who effectively created it. And then right. there's the, you know, how the view from the, how it affected the people on the ground, they had the, the, um, the housekeepers, oh, this woman right. who had done some work for them. Right. Yeah. Her husband was very affected by that crisis and lost a lot of money. And so there's, there's a lot of, and there's a, there's a lot of depth and a lot of sides to all of that, did that whole discussion on wealth and privilege and the old money versus new money and, yeah. Really, she, I, I mean, it was very well done. I just, there were a couple parts that I had, I had some issues with just. Yeah, and I, it's like anything else, nothing can be perfect. I mean, it's not like she No, but I was, I could <laughs> forgive it and I would, it would never prevent me from recommending it to, to all of you. <laughs> the thing is, there's so many things about this book that would appeal to people on different levels. So, I mean, you mm -hmm. know, I, really, I think she just did, for the most part, did it all well. So, and yeah, I, I think it'd be a great book for my mother, personally. I'm going to put it on yeah. hold for her. It's and very entertaining. Like, it's just 
a fun if you if you don't even want to get into the some of the deeper like if you don't want to think too hard you can just read it on the surface and enjoy the characters and the 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 satire aspects of it i think good okay good um i'll jump in if we have time we can throw out a couple other things but uh no that was fun. i'm just so glad you read it so i could talk about it <laughs> <laughs> for sure for sure um the book i'm going to talk about is by margarita montemore it might be Montemore, I'm not sure, but it's M-O-N-T-I-O-T-I-M-O-R-E. It's called Una Out of Order. Um, now, if you can suspend your disbelief and go with the nonlinear flow of this novel, then you'll probably as be as enthralled with Una's journey as I was. 19-year-old Una wakes up in her 51-year-old body, taking our main character and the reader on a yearly time-jumping experience. Sometimes the experience is an ordeal, and other times it's a joyful romp. Um, she lives her life on a chronological order, uh, year by year, starting on her 19th birthday, which happens to be January 1st, which is a, a lovely, you know, easy to say. It, uh, now, she initially learns about who she is every time she wakes up on the 1st of January uh, uh, through notes from herself that she's left to herself or help from a few trusted people in her life. Um, and actually, as challenging as this plot seems and sounds, it, it's, it's really easier for the reader, at least for me as a reader, in some ways, because she learns this wisdom along the way that makes it a lot easier for you to deal with these changes as well, if that makes any sense. Now, all of the places in Una's life are well illustrated. The pace of the story is page turning because of the ever-changing landscape of her life. I mean, each chapter's ending is an existential cliffhanger. And I'm not kidding, it really is, because you never know where she's gonna end up, and neither does she. Um, she's sometimes annoying. Una is annoyingly moody, even with good reason for someone who deals with this. But it's easy, she's easy to like, and uh, the tension between her internal age and her external one is really brilliant and very well drawn. That, that is very interesting. You know, the, her first year, she is 19 mm. years old, a 51 year old woman's body. And, she, the, the author does a really good job of, of, of fleshing that all out. Um, the supporting cast is complex, varied. I don't want to go into a lot, a lot of them because you really want to discover them yourselves. Um, she uses humor throughout the book, really well done, especially in conversations. A lot of it's driven by conversations. And the details of popular social and musical culture pop up a lot because it's how sort of how you know which decade she um, and how it's affected mm -hmm. her. And it's really, really, that was fun uh, for someone who is a child of the 60s and 70s. She's actually a child of the 80s and 90s. So I mean, like, it was, it was a lot of fun to, to, to read that. Um, now, what I like that she did very much in this respect is very quickly, she let the author lets us know how, how why Una's predicament can hide and how, why she can hide it from some people, because you question that in a book like this, like why, why doesn't people figure this out? She explains that and she also explains how she supports herself very well financially so that you're never questioning mm -hmm. why can she do this? So, so she sort of takes care of that right away so that you're not thinking about it and questioning it. So therefore you can go with <laughs> Thank you. In it. And it's nice. I thought this, this was very clever. Um, it's really absolutely a relationship story because it's, cel it's a celebration of li living life, especially in the moment. Um, it's a deep dive into the workings of parents, especially mother-child dynamics. And it's amusing how, it's amusing on how, how, how some society's ills change through our wisdom and others sadly do not. And there's, there's a lot of, uh, of that in the book as well, but it's usually in the background. Um, I would suggest that this is really a lovely lighter take on time travel for people who loved Kate Atkinson's Life After Life or Niff and Negger's The Time Traveler's Wife. Those fans might like it, but I also think it's a bit more accessible than those were stylistically. And a lot of readers may come to it from it from a different angle because of that. I also thought that Mike Chen's Here and Now and Then, which was a book from last year, which was a very creative view of time travel, especially about the father-daughter relationship, is a really good view to like for this. And um, also, what rang true for me is maybe people who like something like Leanne Moriarty's um, When Alice Forgot, 
because of the time okay. jumping. It's a different thing, but about the fact that she remembers things about different mm. ages in different ways. So those are all some read-alikes. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you like movies like Quantum Leap or, or movies like 13 going on uh, 30, you know, this might appeal to you as well. But it's really in a really very creative debut by a, 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 someone who wasn't afraid to do a few things that are sort of risky. She pulls it off and it's a fresh take on time travel and relationships that I look forward to seeing next time. So okay. I, it was a lot of fun, a real, real lot of fun. So you know, it, I think we've come to our 30 minute oh. mark. So wanna, does anybody want to shout something out before we say goodbye? I was yeah. just quickly going to say, Kevin, uh, Kevin Kwan, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, yep. has a new book out, Sex and Vanity. It's, I would say, not quite as good as those, uh, those the, that series, that trilogy, but the, it's just as fun. It's like the plot's not quite as fun, but it's, it's so much fun. If you love the lives of the rich and ridiculous, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that'll do it. it that, that, that'll do it. The plot is so secondary. <laughs> fantasy of a different order when you read that. Yes. You know? yeah. Totally different. Great, thank you. Did you want to say something else, Beth? Well, I have a, okay. I also have kind of a, I have a very quick, like, another horror shout out that's very different from uh, Only Good Indians, but if you are a zombie person, uh, just released is The Living Dead, which is like the massive, like, giant epic, um, co-written, was started by George Romero before his death, and it was finished by Daniel uh, Kraus, um, and it just came out, and it's like, what if we told the entire story of what happens in George Romero's like living dead films from the very beginning to the ending wow. uh, in one, in one book. So a, ma a really massive effort. And I, I, I actually just finished it. I thought it was, it was very good. So if you are a zombie person, um, I would say. Zombie people. <laughs> I know. I know. There definitely are zombie people. So <laughs> lots of people are. <laughs> Alrighty, so I mean, I'll wrap it up by saying that um, you know a lot of a lot of these books are found on the shelves of the BB Library and other libraries in the Noble Consortium. There's many of them in ebook format, audio format. Um, just reach out to one of the librarians by calling you know calling the number you can find on the screen, and um, or emailing, and we'll they will be very happy to help you find what you would like and make sure we would greedy little reader hands. I know I rely on them a great deal. So anyway, thank you very much. And um, for the next BB Buzz. And thank you, Leanne, for guest hosting. It was happy to, we are happy to have you back. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.